So Seamus, I hope you've been playing some video games this week, because otherwise I'm going to have to let you go. I have, in fact, played a ton of video games this week. Oh, good. I was not looking forward to that conversation. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, I've only played two, but I played a lot of both of them. I've, you know, we had a huge break there where I was, like, not doing things. <laughs> I was just sick all the time, but now I'm back at it. Nice. First game I played is the one I bought the day before I went in for surgery. I finally got around to playing it this week. Weeks later. Deathloop. This is from the team that made Prey. Wow. So so this is not uh, a Death Stranding, right? This is a different thing. This is a completely different death. The, uh, the death in this game is completely distinct from whatever H Hideo Kojima was doing with Death Stranding. Uh, this, in terms of mechanics, I think they took the positive reception. Uh, okay, okay, there's Prey, and then the year after Prey came out, we got DLC that was called Moon Crash. <laughs> in Moon Crash, you don't play as the main character from the main game. Instead, you have, like, a collection of characters, and I think it's five, and each one of them has a run through the... It's a complex on the moon right yeah and the place is persistent for between runs so you can have your engineer go first and like fix all the doors so that your other characters when they go through will be able to open those doors or you can send your security officer in first and have them kill all the monsters and have that do no good because the game just spawns more friggin monsters <laughs> but theoretically mm -hmm. Theoretically, I I think you you know having the security officer take care of the big stuff. I think the big stuff stays dead. Um, yeah. So it was like, do I put the hacker in first? The, whatever. There was all this strategy. What order and which things will I do with which characters? It was very popular. I really enjoyed it. And I think somebody at Arcane decided, you know, I really like this triple A roguelike thing we're doing. Let's do it again. And so they came up with Deathloop. The idea with Deathloop is there's this island with a weird time loop anomaly on it, right? Hmm. Okay. And 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 that anomaly makes the day repeat constantly. And so these people go to this island and just have this endless party every day. No consequences, you know, just you reach the end of the day and it resets. But you can still remember what happened? Well, not everybody. Some people can remember and some people can't. And that's one of the problems with the place is ever, a lot of these people still think it's the first day. Hmm. Uh, anyway, you play as, what's your name, Colt? And you're supposed to be the security officer for the... For the whole area you're supposed to protect it but for whatever reason you're trying to break the loop if you do some certain things the, the you will break the loop and uh and time will begin passing normally again uh okay and so but what you need to do is learn how to break the loop so it's like okay i gotta go to this area of the island and investigate this okay and then the next day you got to go to a different area of the island and so there's this the day itself is is repeating but each day you have something different to do based on what you learned the previous iteration sure it's kind of like uh outer wilds right and um i'm not clear on why i'm trying to break the loop other than the character just decided he was gonna do that and he was only doing that because his <laughs> enemy is this lady named Julia and she's like talking about how she wants to stop him and he's like oh you're trying to he doesn't know his memory's been recently wiped and so she's like oh I'm not gonna let you break the oh, loop no. oh oh uh, you don't want me to break the loop well then I guess I better start trying to break the loop I'll show you Right, and I have this weird feeling like, is this some kind of reverse psychology bullshit where I'm going to break the loop and then she's going to show up and like, ha ha, I wanted to break the loop and you were, in you were in charge of trying to stop me. 
Um, I don't know if the game's going to do that. I hope not, because that would be dumb and lame. I, I <laughs> wish I had a better reason for breaking the loop than doing it to spite somebody I don't know. Right, and can't remember. And just seems antagonistic right. toward you. Maybe you were buddies and this is all a prank. Right, I don't know. But she, and then I thought, okay, maybe it's this twist and the game's going to reveal that, haha, she's tricking you into breaking the loop. But she shows up once in a while to try and kill you. Hmm. So that would be like really weird of her to constantly, and she does a lot to slow you down. You're like, oh, there's something I need at my apartment. And you get there and she's tossed your apartment and destroyed everything and taken the thing you need. So you have to wait for the loop to reset and get there sooner the next day before she does. Does she also um, remember the loops? She does. Okay. And it's, I'm not clear on why some people remember and some people don't. I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have, and I just hope the game's not doing a too clever by half twist, where it's like, ha ha, this thing you had no reason for doing was actually the bad guy's plan, which you just enacted. And I'm like, well, uh, whatever, fine. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. The, the, it's interesting mechanically. It's a very interesting game. Uh, oh, the whole thing where Juliana shows up and tries to kill you, it's got this... Dark Souls thing where other players can invade your game and that's what, what? Julian is yeah like if another player decides to invade your game they show up as Juliana and then it's player versus player and she's trying oh. to kill you right but that's like that's like the worst kind of player versus player for me like <laughs> if I want to do player versus player I want to jump into like an Overwatch or a Quake 3 arena or an Unreal Tournament and like fight other players and if i want to play single player i want to play single player the last thing in the world i want is to be enjoying a single player and then all of a sudden oh no it's pvp out of nowhere and it's like that's weird do you do you know when it's pvp and when it's not or is it just kind of opaque or uh, what um uh, well if if juliana shows up and you're in online mode then you're in pvp town uh, you can play in offline mode, and then when Juliana shows up, she's just um, driven by AI. Terrible AI. Like, Juliana is supposed to be this terrible threat, but she's she's a pretty badass aimbot. Um, if you don't know where she is, uh, she could wreck your day. But, you know, if you can lure her into, like, a hallway or something, she's absolutely useless. Huh. She just, Seems like an odd yeah. choice. So, right. so then it's actually easier to play in single player mode. Probably. Oh, way easier. Yeah. Pro well, I don't know. I've never tried online. People complain about how bad the AI is, but I'm like, but that's like the AI in any stealth game has to be terrible and dumb because like if they were smarter, it would be impossible. It's right. It's actually not possible for one person with a knife to go into a room full of 30 people and assassinate them one at a time perfectly silently without anybody noticing. If someone 12, 12 steps to your left fell over dead, you would turn your head and look. I certainly hope so. Right? Like, sound is a thing. <laughs> video, video games pretend like everybody has like 90 degree vision kona vision and they can't hear things further than three meters away and that's how stealth games have to work because if they actually had human perceptions they would not follow mechanical mechanically perfect timed patrol routes with narrow cones of vision um and they would notice that their friends had gone missing hey i've passed yeah. this other guy in the hallway every 30 seconds for the last three hours and now he's not there and his helmet's on the floor Maybe something's up. <laughs> Full of holes. Right. <laughs> oh, and you'd be having conversations. The guards would be having conversations with each other and playing games and trying to not fall asleep. Like, they'd, they'd be interacting right. all the time. All the time. Yeah, you'd have conversations constantly going. My goodness, how often do people at a boring job sit there in silence? Like, that's Just rare. Just stare at the wall. So, yeah, a lot of compromises are made in service of the gameplay hmm. and for me i'm fine with that so what ha so so far i like death loop i'm a little nervous that i haven't been given a good motivation for any of the stuff i'm trying to do and i hope the game isn't going to try and gotcha me later 
by saying that all okay. the stuff it's making me do was stupid. But so far, I like it. <laughs> so, so um, do they have enough beds, though, for everyone to sleep in? You know, they don't. But I guess it doesn't matter. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, you, no one ever sleeps. Yeah. That's weird. Right. And the time loop, like, you wake up on the beach every morning. Like, just laying huh. in the sand, face down, and like, <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I guess they don't need a lot of beds. They they have, they have don't have a lot of beds, but they got a ton of booze that, you know, magically replaces mm. every time the loop gets reset. The booze remember being drunk. Okay, so I guess we don't have to answer <laughs> what do they eat. Right. There is food around. There are, like, vending machines. Oh, wait, the vending machines are full of bullets. <laughs> wait, what? Yeah, the vending machines full of bullets. Of course. Everybody's armed to the teeth. You get the impression that some of these people kind of get off on just murdering each other. Like, um, they're kind of acting like a bunch of griefing, drunken, goofy assholes. Um, they're acting like internet people. Hmm. Like, there's no consequences and nobody, you know, somebody can kill you, but you'll just come back. You know, like banning somebody on social media and they just log in again, and they, you know, under a new account. It's kind of like a world with no consequences for these people. And so they're very reckless and weird and a bit crazy. Hmm. That does sound crazy. All right. Well, what have you been up to this week? I've been doing some programming on that spiral thing that I've been uh, working on, but mostly, Ooh. well, I don't know about mostly, but I've been I've been also playing some Dyson Sphere project again because they just came out with achievements on Steam, and so I'm trying to check all the boxes. And that, that's pretty fun. Cool. So wait, you're spiral programming? We we talked. Yeah, about I'm this. also making a. Yeah, I I haven't put any videos up about it since then, but I have um, implemented a few more features for uh, making them easier to work with and stuff. I, once I'm done, I'm going to put it all together in a package for, you know, like a plug-in and make a video about it and stuff. It's not quite there yet, but I've been working on that quite a bit. My parents are also in town, so I've been visiting with them a lot. So I haven't had a lot of time for gaming, but uh, I did get some Dyson Sphere project in. That's cool. I feel bad for not playing that. Um, there was another game that was competing, and I chose the other game over Dyson Sphere Project, and I'm kind of regretting that now. Mm. Dyson Dyson Sphere didn't hook me the first time I played, but everybody else that's played it, like the way they talk about it, it sounds like something I would really like. But now we're getting to the crush at the end of the year, and I don't have a lot of time. I mean, I'm already juggling two games, and uh, there's more on the horizon. There's going to be more games I want to play that are going to land before I'm finished with either of these two. Yeah. The, the main thing they added recently is templates, which is a, a real improvement. Um, they, they had, like, drag and drop, so you can build, like, lines of factories and stuff. But it's real nice to be able to build just a whole block of stuff and not think about it too much. Nice. One of the weird things about the template system, though, is that if your template overlaps one of the breaks in the grid, because the, the grid on the planet is a polar one, so the lines get closer together as you get closer to the North Pole or South Pole, further away from right. the equator. And so if you cross one of those break lines, the, the one of the places where the grid breaks, then you can only ever place your template on that line of of latitude and so it makes for some interesting puzzles for like okay well i want to like do this thing but i have to like offset a little bit so that it's not on this with this weird line or or like i'm just gonna like move all my other stuff out of the way so i can duplicate this one thing that i've already built around yeah so, so the the, the progress the progression in that game is you start on a planet and then you work your way out to working on multiple planets. And then you kind of take over the solar system. And then don't you even... You keep expanding past there, right? Yeah. So you start off uh, gathering stuff by hand and you start building tools. And the tools let you unlock um, better tools. You research higher level tech. And then you get a drive that lets you go to other planets. And so then you can fly between planets. And then you get automation that allows you to ship things between planets automatically and then you unlock the drive that lets you go to other star systems and then you unlock the stuff that lets you ship stuff between star systems and uh and that's basically the end game is is like interstellar 
So you've got planets in solar systems and then solar systems, you know, scattered around. I think there's about maybe 30 or so per game map, um, but they're all procedurally generated. So it's just you can start a new one and you get a whole new system. Yeah. The thing that bugs me about that is what happens when you fill in all 100 million stars? Why can't I expand to another galaxy? <laughs> they do have a weird... <laughs> they have this weird thing where it's like the leaderboard. It's like the Milky Way leaderboard. And so when you... Right? I think it's like for each... They, they have a limited number of seeds, like system seeds or whatever. And each one has a procedurally generated name. And then everyone who's built on that on that seed like when, when they've completed the game on the seed then it like shows up on the leaderboard or whatever and you can see like the total number of people who've worked on this one and like total amount of power generated and you know some stats that they aggregate together so it's but you can't no you can't travel between so between uh star clusters it's called the cluster star cluster can't travel between star clusters which means you can't travel between galaxies yeah which means yeah. just the whole game is just so horribly limited just cramped right <laughs> I get claustrophobia, the, trying to right. you know, build this gargantuan Dyson sphere. It's like, ah, it's too cramped. The, the orbit of this thing is larger than the orbit of the planet that I'm working on it from. <laughs> All right. The other game I played this week, the main game I put the most hours into, is a new MMO. What? Blizzard's done it again? An MMO from Amazon. So you, you've just been buying stuff on the internet. <laughs> right, that's the MMO. It's like, oh, I gotta grind out more household items and then I gotta start working on my furniture. <laughs> they just added achievements to the Amazon store. That's all. That's the whole game. <laughs> it might be a pretty good game. Right. Uh, no, Amazon Game Studios, they made another MMO that, like, came out and then it was so buggy and horrible they unreleased it they they put it back into private closed beta and then <laughs> they just canceled it yeah they, and there were two other games that they were working on right and they were both ended up canceled i think right well they third time's the charm apparently uh yeah so new world the premise of new now this is it isn't medieval fantasy okay but it has all the problems that i have with medieval fantasy <laughs> all the drawbacks right like okay medieval fantasy i'm tired of just walking around in a suit of armor killing guys with a sword or walking around in a robe killing guys with magical fireballs sure now this this game takes place in a sort of age of sale like i want to say it feels 1600s ish it's definitely okay. not medieval but it's still the same. It's still just wilderness, and when you find a town, it's just, you know, wood palisade walls with wood houses. Like, the tech level isn't that different from medieval. And they probably don't have many castles either, because this is like a new world that they're exploring, right? Right. It's like, imagine European expansion, although you can make Asian characters too, so it's just... All of Eurasia. Imagine they sailed west. And instead of finding America, they found this weird magical dimension land that's sort of... Um, well, it crashes all your ships, so it's a bit mysterious why the old world continues to send more. Like, the coast is just <laughs> this wall of wrecked ships, right? Like, ships do not land here. There cannot be any trade. You get near the place and it just wrecks your ship. So, like, what's driving people to sail west to die on these friggin' shores? <laughs> it does seem strange. Right. And then there's this corruption, but then magic kind of works. So, it's like, you know, World of War introduced the mechanics of World of Warcraft to the first, you know, Europeans that visited America. Conquistador versus right. are there natives or are they is it just like fighting rock golems and stuff right no natives there are there are ruins but they're like big stone obelisk things and i haven't gotten anywhere near them because i'm not high enough level yet mm. this game by the way was a gift from jennifer snow thank you jennifer snow she got it for me months ago and now the game's finally out I like this sort of weird idea. This game has a lot of weird ideas. Uh, the other weird idea 
is that there weren't really character classes or crafting classes. In old games, it's like, okay, I am a wizard. And I've decided that jewel crafting is the one crafting thing I'm allowed to do. And it, you know, that's all my, my character can only craft jewels. If I decide I want to make myself some slippers, I can't. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm only allowed to, you know, gather herbs. So, um, I can't gather wood. I can't mine for minerals. I can't do any of that stuff. Like, there's all these gathering professions and then all of these production professions. And in New World, in New World, everybody is allowed to do everything. You just start doing it. Uh, you, you need a tool, but you just walk out. And I found this incredibly hard. To, I, I won't say it's fun, but there is something that keeps me going where um imagine there's a piece of candy oh look there's a piece of candy you walk over to get a piece of candy and as i pick it up i notice oh look a few feet away there there's a few more pieces of candy i better walk over there and get them and as soon as i get to them i realize oh look right on the edge of where i can see there's some more candy and so there's i can't stop playing the game because i'm in trapped in this loop of forever just hoovering up massive resources and the game is fairly <laughs> generous with your carry limit like i've got i don't know maybe 10 boulders and half a dozen trees in my pockets three suits of armor <laughs> good so and then you can just get back to town with your just massive you know semi trailer of loot and then begin crafting yourself crafting yourself into oblivion you know just like okay i'm gonna spend 10 minutes forging stuff and then 10 minutes cooking stuff and then 10 minutes weaving stuff and then 10 minutes brewing stuff hmm and then turn in my quests get the new quests and go back out the other interesting thing with new world is that the towns are player owned and controlled Ooh, are they player built i can't figure that out i haven't seen two like i go from one server to another and when i do that the same town will have different layouts on different servers so i think there's like a marker that says there's a town here but i think the layout of it must be controlled by players to some degree hmm. and so like yeah so there's like some t and i noticed like oh this town they've got a tier three woodworking station Oh, but like everything else is tier one. Oh, they haven't upgraded the rest of the. But over here, they've got a tier three jewel craft. But of course, it's a 20 minute walk between these places. So I imagine the longer the game runs, the more these towns will become more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you pay taxes just automatically, just as you do stuff, you're paying taxes. And whichever faction controls the town they set the taxes but i don't know where the money goes so that's pretty realistic <laughs> um just like real life right i don't really understand who's in charge or how they're chosen or how much money they're getting or what they're doing with it uh but i gotta pay the taxes so yeah very accurate simulation um wow so th is this like is it kind of trying to be more like Eve online where there's like this whole economy that, that's emergent and people are doing stuff and they're kind of off the rails or because it, it seems like it's kind of halfway between that and and the world of Warcraft where it's like this is a storybook world and here's the story that they were telling you right I can't I've been asking myself that same question all week um one of the things that I've you know, I'll, I can't find Fey Iron anywhere. And I went online and I looked at for Fey Iron, Fey Iron, and how do you get it? They're like, well, you mine regular iron. I'm like, I've been doing that for like days at a time. I've literally spent hours and hours mining iron. Oh, well, you got to make sure to eat special brew or cook special food and consume it to up your luck well i did that and spent more hours gathering and i have not found even a single nugget of fey iron and if i had 20 nuggets of it i could use them all right now like i am completely blocked all progress is blocked until i get this next tier of iron that is mysteriously unavailable no matter what i do so i thought 
I will go on the trading post and see if anybody has anything for sale. Sure. No, of course. If this is this is a, if I can't get any, then neither can anybody else. And if they did, they'd be hoarding it because it's so friggin' rare. So, all right. Well, rather than trying to make this better uh, gun, might they have flintlock pistol or not pistols, rifles in the game? Rather than try and craft this gun myself. I'll just go and buy one online and you could on the trading post and you can see it has a slot where they could be listed, but nobody's selling any. Ah, and there are no shopkeepers whatsoever. When you find loot in the world, like, oh, I found a new pair of boots. I can't wear them. The only thing you can do with those boots is salvage them. Just tear them apart for a scrap of leather. Wait a um, minute. Hang on. Hold on a second. So you're telling me that you can pick up any old tool and be sufficiently competent at it to produce something valuable, but you can't just put on any old pair of boots that you find. Oh, no, you, you totally can. But if you have better boots, if you've oh, already okay. got like, yeah, like I'm talking about, I find boots that are like, oh, these would have been great five levels ago. Mm, okay. So interesting. So, but it's like, I mean, I could sell it, but like who would buy it? Because... Everybody is finding boots all over the world, and then everybody else is back in town crafting boots. The, there's this thing from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where they talk about this one planet that destroyed their economy by making shoes, and only sh like the more shoes they made, the worse the shoes become, and so the more shoes everybody had to buy, so the more. So they went for even cheaper shoes that were made even more shoddily, and eventually their entire planetary economy collapsed. <laughs> and that's and that's what I think of every time I think about how the economy works in New World, where there are no sinks for these resources. Like monsters create boots when you can. I mean, it's rare. You know, I'll play for an hour. Wait and a I'll minute. Find... Hang on. So so there are no humanoid enemies in the world, but there. Are oh boots. yeah, there. Oh, there are oh. human enemies. There are human enemies. There's two different kinds. There's, uh, well, there's three. There's corrupted, which I don't know what they're all about. They just look like big evil suit of armor guys that come out of the red mist. And we don't know what their problem is or where they come from. I mean, mm -hmm. I assume they're other explorers. Then there are kind of this zombie type. They're, they're called the lost and they're just like withered. But again, those are explorers that came here and then you know, became these zombie types. And then there's skeletons. So, like, all the enemies are just dead versions of us. <laughs> huh. Uh, anyway, and they sometimes drop boots, and then people make boots. And so there's this continuous flow of boots coming into the world, and nobody needs them. There's no... There's no outflow of boots, other than just salvaging it for some tiny square of leather. That you can use to make another pair of boots. <laughs> uh, so if they're going for an EVE Online thing, I don't think either they're waiting for... Maybe it doesn't work right yet because not enough people have reached the end game. And you need like the players distributed or it'll work right once people hit the level cap or whatever. I'm not sure what the deal is. But right mm. now, it definitely doesn't work. <laughs> but it's really interesting, and it's not working. It's not working, but it's kind of failing in an interesting and harmless way. It is not more stupid than World of Warcraft. It's just a different kind of <laughs> stupid. Okay. And it's also beautiful, I take it. It's on Lumberyard, which is, what, Crisis, right? I guess. I mean, they're all... I would have liked a more storybook look to it. It's just... Uh, okay, more stylized. You know, uh, yeah, it's just kind of vague photorealism. Mm. Um, I compared it to Black Desert Online that I played a couple years ago. Like, yeah, this is all pretty, but there's nothing that I'm really excited about here. Although, New World actually does something that's really important to me, is that you can... F too many MMOs look very homogenous. Mm. And New World is very diverse. The beaches of wrecked ships are very different than the caves and the, the whole network of caves and, and, you know, stone hills, which is different from the forest, which is different from these, like, 
branchless tree. I'm not sure what it looked like a blight came through and so now all the trees are just bare trunks and falling over and like every uh, you know, if you're running at full tilt, about every three or four minutes, you're going to cross a threshold and enter a new biome of sorts. Hmm. So you can get a feel for where you are, right? It feels like you're going somewhere, and it's not just endless miles of forest. And even if it is forest, they have different colors of forest, right? This is something that Black Desert Online really, really needed real bad. The first 50 levels of the game all looked the same. Ah. It was all just the same. It was the trees and the grass were all the same shade of green everywhere you go. <laughs> oh, dear. It was numbing. I mean, it was made by people in Korea. Korea's not a big country. Maybe they just sort of like, well, of course, that's what nature looks like. <laughs> a vast, uniform expanse of homogenized greenery. Right. Like... You know, I don't think South Korea has, like, the Pine Barrens and then the desert. And then, you know, like, in the United States, we've got a lot of different biomes here. Um, and maybe that has influenced the way we make our, our games and what we expect from our media. Like, think about how many mm. movies make, make a conscious effort to change the color palette, you know, throughout the movie. Okay, that's enough time in Cairo. We need to get everybody to Ireland for some reason. Sure, have a new setting. Right. Um. So I've been playing a lot of New World, and I guess that's I guess that's it. I did not get bored and wander back to Death Loop. Death Loop's waiting there, so I must like New World more than Death Loop. But mostly, it's just because I can't help myself. And being able to gather and craft everything just traps me in a continuous loop of gathering and crafting forever, and I can't stop. Now, um, is this gonna? Is this their strategy to like get your subscription fees from now until the end of time, or like what's their monetization thing on there? I think I don't think there's a monthly fee. I certainly never signed up for anything like that. It, I haven't seen anything about renewal. So I think they're doing the free to play th or you pay, you know, pay up front and then they pay for it with cosmetics. Ah. I did notice there's um there's there's very little difference in the armors you wear. And then um and then you could pay I, I actually it kind of bothers me like right now the big alternate skin you can get are the Twitch skins. If you if if you watch 10 hours of people streaming New World, this actually sucks. I tried to do this. You have to link your Amazon account to your Steam account to your Twitch account. So you have to link all three accounts, which is a massive pain in the ass. They required two-factor authentication with two different things. It was... It sucked so bad. Like, I got halfway through and I was suffering from, like, sunk cost fallacy. It's like, well, I put 15 minutes into this so far. I don't want to quit now. Oh, no. And I got through it. And then I started watching a stream. And then I wasn't getting credit for watching a stream. I was like, no, no. And plus, watching somebody else play an MMO you're already playing. Just, I realized how stupid it Well, I realized 10 hours. I, there's no way. I... I couldn't watch my best friend play this game for 10 hours. There's no way I'm going to watch some internet rando. Man. Well, it's probably for, like, people who are have a day job and, you know, you put it on in the background while you're doing something right. else and, you know, rack up some points while you can't be playing it because you're supposed to be working. But if you do watch your 10 hours of New World streams, you unlatch you unlock the Twitch skins, which are these weird, like, you can apply it to any weapon at any time, right? You just equip the weapon, apply the skin, like, it's more applied to your weapon slot. So anything you put into your weapon slot will now appear with this color and this shape, right? So you're replacing hmm. the visual of whatever hammer you have equipped or whatever, right? Sure. But it's like, it's like this technicolor wonder it's like purple and blue and cyan and it looks like a big piece of candy like a big <laughs> and i'm like really you made this like you made the aesthetics of the game fairly grounded 
you know, everybody's running around in roughly period appropriate clothes. I'm sure they took, I'm sure they cut some corners and did some cheating to get a little more variety in it, but it is all plausible, right? Wow. And then on top of it, you could watch Twitch streams and unlock this absolutely gaudy purple magic hammer. And it's like, man, if they're willing to do that on day one, on launch day, then how bad is it going to get once they start selling this shit on a cash shop? You're going to have people wandering around in purple capes and glowing wizard hats and, you know, robo boots by this time next year. <laughs> and that sounds like a great business strategy. They're monetizing people trolling each other. Right? I mean, and I know people will buy that stuff because nobody has respect for this setting. Like <laughs> I named, I named my character um, Abraham Whitlock. And I was like, all right, that feels like a European coming to the new world. And I get in there, and it's you know Juju Man six 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 and Bum Destroyer and Blaze It sixty nine sixty nine sixty nine. Or Siri uh, from the Witcher series, but spelled with two I's and three R's. <laughs> uh, we can so, imagine what cosmetics that character will be wearing in a year. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, as soon as they start selling ridiculous cosmetics, everybody in this... everybody in the, I've been trying to, like, look as grounded as possible and, like... I even trying to make myself more plain, like, oh, this hat with a big feather in it is a bit too ostentatious. Can I hide my hat? No, I can't. You can't hide your hat, <laughs> damn it. Um, okay, like trying okay. To so they, they, first they make this setting, they try to get people invested in it, role-playing and stuff, you know, looks all consistent, and then they get people to pay them to wreck the setting so that everyone yep. looks like a crazy clown. And then they get the people who are annoyed at them to pay them to mute all the other people's cosmetics. <laughs> yes! Yes! It's like um, the phone companies when they sell you spam filtering tools and then they sell anti uh -huh. spam filter circumventing tools to the spammers. And uh, then they sell you better spam filtering tools. Yeah, it's that again, where you're just supplying both sides in an ongoing conflict. Good work uh. if you could find it, I guess. Man, well, they're creating it for themselves at this point. All right. What do you say we do some mailbags? Yeah. This first one is something a little different. Uh, in honor of this being episode 357, dear Diecast listeners, what's your favorite video game firearm? If you could take a gun from an old game and have it in a modern one, gut one what gun would it be? Also, most of you are going to answer the Doom 2 shotgun or the Half-Life 2 revolver. That can be your answer if you want. But see if you can come up with any other amazing examples. Seamus. That's a really good question. Thank you, Seamus. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and I just want to praise you also for keeping it short and to the point. This is a solid question. A+. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is a reverse mailbag. I want to hear... Now, I thought of giving my own answers for this. But if I give answers, it's going to taint the results. And so I want to see what people say. Um, so, and I know you're not much of a shooter guy, so I don't suppose you'd have an answer for this. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned Colt from before, and like that brings to mind the Colt 44 Magnum, which is a pretty, pretty solid answer, I think. That might even be the handgun from, from uh, Half-Life 2. Yeah, I was wondering if, if that is. I don't know. Um, so please tell me in the comments below, what is your favorite in video game firearm? What game from, you know, what gun from what game do you wish you could just take to another game with you? All right. Um, another point of order here is that Leslie Beldotti wrote in a really good question and I started thinking about my answer and then I realized it needed to be an article. So... I'm going to handle that question on its own, hopefully later this week. We'll see if I can get it cool. done. All right. I'll let you take the next one. Oh, thanks. Here we go. Dear DieCast, 
Recently, I've been reading Jason Schreier's book named Press Reset. The first chapter is about Warren Spector, who needs no introduction. I'm going to skip a bit here. Uh, the chapter describes many ups and downs of his career, but suffice to say the man is a veteran of the industry. What struck me, stri striked me, striked me, however, is how he described his approach to creating games. That in order to make a great game, you have to go over budget and over time. Otherwise, it's simply not possible. Quote, can you name one game that is shipped on time and on budget that anybody cares about? Unquote. Now, I know it's a common thing to point at publishers and accuse them of being incompetent and greedy and nincompoops, and many times it's probably true. Uh, let's see, uh, but at the same time, you can understand them a little. And imagine if you had to hire someone who openly admits that he will go over time and over budget, because that's how he rolls. I don't have any experience making games, so I just want to ask, do you think this is true? That in order to be a truly great game, the game needs to go overboard and be done under pressure? Cheers, Derek. P.S. This question is supposedly only three sentences long, but tell me, guys, can you name one question that had an appropriate length that anybody cared about? Oh, well <laughs> done, Derek. Well played. Well played, yes. <clears throat> you are forgiven for making it too long, because it paid off so well. So, yeah, I I find myself disagreeing with Warren Spector, who is one of my heroes, and agreeing with the publishers, who are my nemesis. Um... Saying you have to go over time and over budget makes no sense. Just budget more time and money. Like the whole point of budgeting is so the publisher can, you're basically saying you want to lie to them about how much it's going to cost because you want to trick them into funding your game that's going to be a boondoggle that they would never agree to up front. Yeah, um, it doesn't sound very above board, does it? No, and... Also, I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll bet there are fantastic games that were done on time and within budget. But, you know, you don't hear about them. Nobody does an expose about, here's the story of the game that went okay and everybody was fine. And it was a good experience. Like, there's no story there. We only hear about the disasters where some asshole ran the company into the ground and spent all the money and everybody hated each other and the thing was delayed four times and they kept changing platforms and tools and nobody knew what was going on and they got canceled twice and then at the end they finally got just enough funding to push the thing out the door and it was so broken everybody hated it anyway. Like, that's those are the games we hear about. But yeah, the story of the game that is fine and got done on time and uh, and within budget is... You don't hear about those. So that's a bit of a... Like, you can't answer that question. Because that's... If I said, name one person at this company that makes under $50,000 a year that's actually worth a damn. It's like, well, I'm sure there are tons of them, but I don't know who anybody, how much anybody makes. So I can't point to anybody and tell you. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to be an industry insider to kind of have the insight as to whether or not that's the case or not. Right. Um, and the, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here and agree with well, it's not much of a limb, I guess. Agree with Warren Spector that I think what he's trying to say, or or I can imagine him trying to say that when you're making a game, if it all goes to plan, it probably wasn't very interesting, and people aren't going to care about it very much because you could see what it was going to be right from get-go, right? Just like, okay, we're going to do this and this and this. This is going to be our budget. This is going to be our schedule. And then you execute it. And it's like, yes, is exactly what we expected. It's Farmville 3.0. And like, it's you're just cranking it out. But you're not doing anything creative. You're not breaking new ground. You're not doing anything interesting because it, as evidenced by, you knew what you were doing when you went into it. If you really yeah. find something fascinating, you're like, whoa, what can we do with this system? Whoa, this was unexpected. Whoa, hang on. How do we explore this? How do we convince the players to engage with this system, this crazy thing? Like, what's going on here? Then, of course, you're going to go over time and over budget because you didn't know that you were going to do that. You were surprised by something. You, you encountered something unexpected. You deliberately embraced a... An idea that did not have a roadmap. So, of course, right. you didn't know how long it was going to take. I can see, okay, that makes some kind of sense. It's still it's kind of a raw deal for the publishers, though. Right. Dear Diecast, Trilogies! Who doesn't like the anticipation of an excellent game? Getting a sequel, having the sequel change everything good from the first to bad, and having the third piss on the first's grave. Messy effects aside, I wonder whether the trilogy is actually a great opportunity to iterate and improve 
game concepts. One particular example that jumps to mind is the Creeper World series. The first was fun, but especially from a production value perspective, not much more than a playable prototype. The second changed almost everything, and I like the gameplay quite a bit less than the first. The third stays more true to the concept of the first, yet still uses many good ideas from the second, and has much better production value. Are there other video games that use their trilogy to iterate and improve? Or do any notable missed opportunities come to mind? With kind regards, Marvin. So, if you're doing this, then I sort of have a, have a question to ask. Why are you limiting yourself to trilogy? Mm -hmm. Like, Well, Creeper World does have Creeper World 4 now, but uh, yeah. It does seem to go in, in cycles like that. Right, like, um, if it's going to be an ongoing series, then don't do a trilogy. For one thing, doing a three-game story arc is friggin' hard, mm. regardless of whether you're doing the Mass Effect thing or not. What more? Get, nobody's doing this, and everybody should be doing this. You should be making anthologies. Don't take the same main character and drag him through. Oh, you, you defeated the evil Spy Corp in the last game, but now they're. Oh, look out, Captain Awesome! They're back. I guess you'll have to unretire for the tenth friggin' time so that you can take them down again. But don't worry, it's not a <laughs> right. Sisyphean task. This time, I'm sure they'll stay dead forever. Like, that's a terrible way to tell stories, is to just retell the same story, but tacked onto the end of the previous iteration. Like, either tell an ongoing, you know, story with a beginning and an end, or tell a series of disconnected stories. Okay, the other thing you could do is like the soap opera slash Assassin's Creed style thing, where you mm. don't have an end in sight you just make up more and more bullshit as you go along just you know it's not the same character every time but it's supposedly you're making the story longer but it it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere i hate that but that's at least appropriate for the medium mm. yeah it does seem weird to have the same character doing a bunch of stuff like the um what was the the treasure hunter guy nathan drake uh, nathan drake yeah like seems like or, or Laura Croft, right? It's like, well, can we just tell, like, stories of Tomb Raiders? Does it have to be the same Tomb Raider every time? Or it could be different takes on the same character. Like, we have a hundred different versions of Sherlock Holmes. Sure. Or Batman or Spider-Man. It's like, okay, well, here's a, a different angle of this archetype. You're not really telling a story about a specific person. You're exploring an idea of the shape of some sort of character. Right, they weren't pretending that Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock was also the Sherlock played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Like, and that they were in a connected continuity. No, it's just, you know, everybody tells their own story. You know, switch the names around and mix things up, but, you know, tell the same style of story. That's what I want to say. It's worked great for Final Fantasy, or at least it did. Um <laughs> For a while, a oh, decade or two. Yeah, the last decade's been pretty much a wash for Final Fantasy, I think. <clears throat> like, speaking of trilogy, um, Lightning is apparently the least appreciated, like, everybody hates Lightning. And she, I think Lightning is a she, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, she got a trilogy, and everybody was like, why do you keep making games about Lightning? Nobody gives a shit about Lightning. Please tell us anything else. <laughs> um yeah so my my answer to this question is more companies should do anthologies or if you have to an ongoing series but don't try to just keep the same continuity going with the same characters it gets old and you have to pack it with more and more contrivance if you think about it the best the, mo the reason you fell in love with the game is because it was introducing you to all these new characters you'd never met before and this strange new world and how it works and like you want that constant feeling of discovery and excitement and you don't know what's going to happen next and you can't have that if it's the same characters fighting the same guys in the same situations in the same world. 
then right. you, instead of discovering new things, we have to constantly stop. And well, I thought he was dead. Oh no, I thought these guys were defeated. Oh no, they had money left over after the thing. They they have the secret plan that we didn't know about before. And, and like you, all the exposition instead of revealing exciting new ideas, it's constantly just these band aid patches to hold the story together for just one more entry. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. It it does seem uh it does seem like more people could try the Final Fantasy approach of like, look, here's the here's the game shape that we've got. It's got a hero, it's got a scrappy group of guys that get together, it's got an airship and uh some sort of world ending monster from beyond the, the universe. Okay? Now we're gonna explore that idea. Those those are the themes. And then, you know, like, each game is going to be doing those themes. If you like those themes, great, stick around. But, like, we're not going to have Cloud every time. It's not going to be Clouds from right. now to the end of the universe. It's going to be Cloud this game, and next game it's going to be some other guy. Probably not somebody as cool as Cloud, but whatever. <laughs> you got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> I mean, it's better than just making Cloud less interesting over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't want to, yeah, you don't want to keep going back to that well. All right. Okay, go ahead and take this last one, and then we will once again have cleared the mailbag. Two weeks in a row. We are the real heroes here. Yes, three in a row, and we'll have a trilogy of clearing the mailbag. <laughs> Dear Diecast, have you guys seen Star Wars Visions? I know it's a bit of a meme nowadays that anything that's not the sequel trilogy is the greatest Star Wars thing since the originals, but Visions felt genuinely fresh and fun in a way that the fan service ridden Mandalorian Season 2 wasn't and isn't even canon. Love, Donkey. I, I have not even heard of Star Wars Visions. Seamus? I watched, I, I sort of saw blah 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 Star Wars Visions and I just rolled my eyes. Uh, I didn't say anything but last year Star Wars and I broke up. Um, it was kind of, it was kind of messy. I threw Star Wars out. Star Wars had to come by and get its records that it left here. <laughs> we had a sh we had a shared Netflix account that we had to get we had to fight over. It was it was a whole thing. John Williams isn't talking to either of you now, right? Star Wars would like message me in the middle of the night. Oh, uh, oh, how you doing? Oops, I didn't mean to message you, Seamus. I meant to message my new boyfriend. It was just accident. My new boyfriend, who's way younger and has more money than you. And he's happy to buy merchandise, no matter what, no matter how low the quality. <laughs> and uh, so it's it hasn't been good between the two of us. And this whole thing, I just where I just stopped, I just stopped answering all these calls. I blocked Star Wars right after the hyperspace eyes incident in Episode Seven, uh, and like you know, I haven't heard from him since then. So that's it's all for the best. <laughs> right. For me, I guess everything th this. Uh, Donke suggests that um, everything that's not the sequel trilogy is the greatest Star Wars thing. No, I still think the prequel trilogies are absolute garbage. I guess they're more interesting than the sequel trilogy. Maybe. But no. Basically, when it comes to Star Wars movies of the mainline, nine movies, two-thirds of them are unwatchable. It's just the first three. And really, if we're being totally honest, it's just the first two. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I think maybe you could make an argument that it's just the first 12 and a half minutes of episode three. Wait, episode you know, the, the three? thing where they're like, they're, yeah, they're, they're flying through. The, I think that's the part where they're flying through the Coruscant, right? And there's just like this giant CG chase scene. That's what John, oh, that's, right. what he really, that's what they really wanted the movie to be all along. The whole sequence, the, everything was just culminating in that moment. In that absolutely incomprehensible moment of just visual soup. Uh-huh. But it was all one take. <laughs> Can you believe <laughs> they, they did it all in one take? How did they do that on their computers? <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, episode, uh, episode four was magical and um uh, i don't know if i don't know if episode six lived up to it i mine was always um return of the jedi it was my favorite but uh, that was when i was a kid and i i think maybe uh maybe i was wrong uh no i mean i'll take any of those three movies as being the best the the third the return of the jedi is certainly a great ending 
It it's the one where George Lucas's merchandising started to creep in. Like Han Solo should have died in that movie. <laughs> That's his arc. That's his arc is he was a selfish a-hole in the first movie and he becomes the sa self-sacrificing hero at the end of the third. That's the perfect arc for that for that character. And people said that to George Lucas mm -hmm. and he said, I don't want to sell dead Han Solo dolls. Like he was thinking, oh, who cares about the story? What would that do to my merchandising? Uh... Also the Ewoks. So, like, yeah, you can see merchandising decisions creeping into the movie. And that, that didn't ruin the movie, but it was definitely some compromises. And I even understand mm. why he did it. It wasn't just because he's greedy. Um, it was because he wanted to be an independent. He wanted to be independent of the studio. He wanted to make enough money that he could make whatever movie he wanted and he wouldn't have to go to the studios and plead and beg and can I have a little more more money oh we'll give you more money but you got to have this actress as your lead and she has to get her tits out somewhere in act two. Oh, that doesn't really fit with my script and I'm like tits or no money um he didn't yeah, want to do that it's, it's a pretty crazy industry right and so i respect his desire to be free of that at the same time you sort of became the studio when you were trying to escape the studio <laughs> <laughs> right right you can't you can't win that one right it's like oh you wouldn't do escape those money grubbing guys that don't care about art so you compromised your art in the name of money i don't know was that worth it <sighs> anyway anyway he's a fascinating character george lucas is a fascinating character anyway i was not offended by the fan service in the mandalorian i watched visions to get back to this question from donkey the first episode of visions envisions a lightsaber duel taking place in what looks like a very japanese feudal japan and the, and the and the force users like they're sith and jedi whatever they are are styled to look like ronin hmm. But it's like, but that's the source material. That's like, okay, right. guys, I've got an, I've got an idea. We'll make a secret to speed too. Okay, but get this: instead of being set on a boat, it'll be set on a bus, <laughs> which is just speed <laughs> one. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or we're gonna make, okay, we're gonna make a, uh, we're gonna make a version of Apocalypse Now, but we're gonna set it in the 19th century Congo instead of the Vietnam War. Which is just Heart of Darkness, which is the source for Apocalypse uh -huh. Now. It's like... Uh -huh. uh, it's, it, that's a weird thing to do. It was fine. It's all style and flash. And it's it serves the strengths of Star Wars today. It's all style and no substance because nobody, nobody within um, 14 parsecs of this property knows how to tell tell a story about characters absolutely nobody and mm. so just don't try just don't try make your do the mandalorian thing where your main character is just wearing a helmet the whole time and is expressionless or just do these little vignette stories where eh, we don't have to dig too deep into anybody's character we just base them on other characters from other works and we have them come in and fill the screen with lasers and lightsabers um and it'll be really cool that kind of reminds me of uh the into the matrix like that anime thing they did right after yeah the first matrix movie the animatrix the animatrix yeah that one how it was like all this stuff that made the matrix less interesting <laughs> it just added a bunch of lore craft and plot holes to the matrix for these little vignette right. stories that don't matter yeah yeah, where it's like, okay, this is interesting, but like, this isn't what we came here for. And and like, is this your concept art? What are, what are, what are you showing us here? The Animatrix, I will never get over the scene in the Animatrix where they have built intelligent robots and then enslaved them. And they have the robots carrying stuff onto a ship. And I'm like, <laughs> did you guys <laughs> uninvent the crane? You know, have you seen what our cargo ships can do? 
Get, go on YouTube and watch a cargo ship load shipping containers off and on a on and off a boat. It needs one human being and zero robot slaves. And like right. now right. you replace it with this massively inefficient, like everybody just pulling this cargo container with like ropes, like they're Egyptian slaves. And like <laughs> You were guys they building deserve... a pyramid with them? They were like building a giant pyramid with cargo containers or something. I don't know. It made no damn sense. Yeah. Why? You, yeah, you so don't goofy. even need intelligent machines for that. Yeah. You need a tractor. We've had fucking tractors for two centuries now. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why did you? Ins yeah. They in make they make trucks specifically to carry ISO boxes. Like it, it's easy. It's a solved problem. Right. Why would you invent robot slaves and then give them enough intelligence and program them to hate being slaves? Yeah. Ah. Uh, so dumb. Although that reminds and me the, of the Tesla bot that's coming out. Does, does it hate driving? No, no. They're well. They're making an android, like a like a human shaped robot that they're going to put the AI, like all the navigation stuff, and into the robot so then it can like navigate stuff and won't run into people and. Then you supposedly you can like tell it to do stuff and it can do things for you. Okay, so they're pretending they're not building a sex bot. We haven't gotten to the no, part he, where they'll I admit. Think, I think Elon admitted on stage that people, I'm sure people will find some interesting things to do with it. Silent smirk. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> He's still trying to get his engineers to figure out how to program it to love him. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, no, you, when it's this early in the project, you definitely don't want to admit you're making a sex bot. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, really, these self-driving cars, how long is it going to take before somebody makes one that's actually a really ho a homebody that hates travel? Ah, uh, it's so silly. It'll... It's so silly that, that the idea that that could happen has become so plausible through so many instances of it happening in fiction that people think that it's actually right. a real thing. It's like, no, you right. don't accidentally invent a hammer that hates hammering nails. That's not, right. that's not what you do. Nobody nature does that. Did not, nature did not accidentally invent bees that hate making honey and they just want to go off and do their own thing. Like, oh, I gotta go back to the hive and shake my tail for everybody, and I'm just so sick of it. And I really just want to go into a tree and build a nest and lay some eggs. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly there are bees in history that have done that, but they died. And they died. they're not around right. anymore. Just like the hammer that won't hammer nails, right? Like, you got a hammer, it won't hammer nails, you don't make any more of those. There are no hammers that don't hammer nails anymore, because all of those ones are dead. They're They're gone. And it's the same thing with the, the, the self-driving cars that won't drive. It's like, well, you make one of those, it doesn't work. You, you tear it apart for pieces and make another one that does work. It's, it's not like you're going to create this whole society of completely dysfunctional objects. Right? <laughs> they hate the purpose for which they were designed. Yeah. A sex bot that's actually really, really uncomfortable with nudity and really shy. <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's a turn on for somebody. I'm not going to judge, but oh yeah, you know. yeah, that's true. That's true. When you're talking about sex, all bets are off. I don't know. I don't know what people are into, and I don't want to. I don't want to know about it. Okay. Well, well, hopefully, there's that kind of fan service in Star Wars Visions, right? That would that would get get me to finally message Star Wars back one of these days. Hey, Star Wars, you up? Oh boy. All right, thank you for the good questions, everybody. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. If we're lucky, I will answer one more question later this week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye! Goodbye!